Hi, folks. Welcome to the series Viewing Multidimensional Poverty from Many Angles, coming to you today from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., Oxford University in Oxford, UK, and the United Nations in New York City. This is the second episode of the 2022 series, exploring the multidimensional poverty index and other related metrics and how they're used in policy. I'm James Foster, the Oliver Carr Professor and Vice Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University, representing the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP. I'm here with Sabina Alkar, Director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, in the Department of International Development of Oxford University, and along with our colleagues at the Human Development Report Office of the UNDP, we are pleased to offer today's presentation, Extending Multidimensional Poverty Identification from Additive Weights to Minimal Bundles, presented today by Sam Jones of Copenhagen and UNU Wider, with discussion by yours truly. In just a moment, I'll ask Sabina to describe the series and introduce the speakers. But first, I'd like to express my appreciation to the team at OFI for lining up a great series this term and to Kyle Renner and the team at IAP for producing the series online. Please join us Monday next week at the same time for our next MPI event when Kahinde Omotoso of the University of South Africa will be presenting Profiling gender Gendered Multidimensional Poverty and Inequality in Post-Apartheid South Africa with Jacob Asa of UNDP as a discussant. And if you missed something and you wanted to see, just catch the reruns of this um, at the YouTube ca uh, channel IIEPGW. Now, without further ado, let me turn it over to Sabina Alkaya for her introductory remarks. Please, Sabina. Thank you so much, James. <clears throat> so this series is trying to bring into conversation methodological innovations or suggestions or ideas that have been um, constructed and worked by academics and others um, outside of the UN institutions. And we're just trying to really listen and scope um, to see what is coming up, how people are building methodologically on the work of multidimensional poverty measurement, and then how to use those innovations and findings as we move forward. So I'm delighted today that Sam Jones uh, will be presenting his work. He's a research fellow at UNU Wider, but he's based in Mozambique, and he's on extended leave from his position as an associate professor in the University of Copenhagen Department of Economics. And he has published in many places, um, primarily on microeconomic empirical methods related to labor, markets, education, finance, uh, policy, but also in this case, poverty. And he's published in many leading journals, JW, JDE, WBER, American Journal of Agricultural Economics, Food Policy, et cetera. And um, his work primarily has been focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. And he's previously worked extensively in Mozambique, um, spending 10 years as an advisor to the Ministry of Finance. And Mozambique was one of the first countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to launch an official national MPI. So there is coherence also at the policy level. So we're really delighted to consider his propositions today. And as commentator is our own co-host, Professor James Foster, the Oliver T. Carr Junior Professor in International Affairs and a professor of economics and co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy. Not and, anymore. Uh -huh, and vice dean um, of the Elliott School for International Affairs. So he's had so many different roles. And then with Ophi, he is a research associate in, in Ophi and the University of Oxford. And he has long-standing interests and insights and breakthroughs in welfare economics, in poverty measurement, um, in approaches to social indices. And these include um, unitary, unidimensional and multidimensional poverty measures, um, and also innovative applications of multidimensional poverty measures, for example, in the Global MPI or the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index or a Better Jobs Index or Statistical Performance Index of the World Bank. He did his doctorate in Cornell 
um, and also received a doctorate honoris causa from the Universidad Autónoma de Estado Hidalgo in Mexico. So wonderful group, uh, wonderful exchange, and it's over to you, Sam. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Sabina and James. Uh, and uh, welcome to everyone today. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. So uh, there you go. Let me just share my screen. <laughs> um, great. I hope you can see this. Um, right. So yeah, as, uh, as, as James mentioned, this uh, is um, a, a rather slightly more, I guess, technical presentation. So apologies in advance on um, some ideas on extending multidimensional poverty identification. Um, let me begin with some motivation. So, uh, well, Sabina and James may, may remember, but uh, I mean, I've, I presented um, a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, both in Oxford and at uh, some UNU wider um, conferences on multidimensional poverty. So it's, a, it's an area that I've had a lot of interest in um, you know, for a long time, perhaps in a more of a flirting way, I guess, in some respects, but certainly it's been something I've always come back to. And one of the initial areas that I, I have been interested in or was interested in is the question of robustness. So, you know, when one takes, you know, any kind of virtually any kind of multidimensional uh, poverty index, um, there's always some, you know, question about what degree of importance or weight do we apply to the different um, underlying dimensions. And so, you know, looking at the uh, at many of the standard approaches, you know, this is intimately connected with the challenge of, you know, how do we actually choose these? And does it matter uh, if we place slightly more weight on one dimension than, than, than another? And, and what kind of intrigued me, um, at least at the beginning, was that it seemed to me, well, there's kind of an, almost an infinite number of choices uh, of these vectors of weights, if you want them. But actually, the set of outcomes seems to be effectively finite. Uh, of course, it's bounded between zero and one. And uh, at any reasonable significance level, there's obviously not going to be much difference uh, when we make infinitesimal changes to some of these different weights. So this led me in one direction, which was to um, something called a good Turing estimator of missing distributional mass. And, and uh, I published a paper that I don't think anyone has ever read, but uh, on, on the issue of stochastic simulation. So that's basically how do you measure when you've done enough uh, coverage of all these, if you search across all these different weights, for instance, when do you know that you've done enough searching? So there's some ways you can, you can basically tell uh, a simulation method to stop searching because we've found all the possible answers. But more recently, I've, I've actually circled back to the same issues, and this took me <clears throat> down a different track and this is the paper that I, I want to uh, share with you today. And I, and I should say up front that, um, that the paper really builds on a lot of work that's, that's gone on in the past. So I wouldn't really claim to be necessarily having you know, hugely you know, novel um, insights, but it, perhaps the way they're put together provides something interesting. So this paper did actually come out um, last year in the Journal of Economic Inequality, and it's available open access. So if you want to go and read it, um, please feel free. Okay, so the, so the issue really starts off with how do we um, do this identification in you know, multidimensional, most multi, a lot of different multidimensional poverty indexes. And just to avoid confusion, allow me to, to just to um, set out some terminology. So uh, standard um, terminology, more or less, I hope, but we talk about dimensions here, other uh, underlying indicators of deprivation. It could be housing, it could be education, it could be uh, a specific aspect of education, specific aspect of housing, specific access of sanitation, for instance. And what we're gonna assume here is that these uh, are binary. So you're either deprived or you're not deprived. And we assume they're just given by the data. So we're not interested in this paper about how we choose which dimensions to put into an index. Uh, then we have domains, and these are groups of deprivation indicators. So we might call them education. So that could be a bunch of different um, indicators about education, a bunch of different indicators of health, a bunch of different indicators of housing. So these are groups of deprivation indicators that, that some of us may be familiar with. And then we have identification. So this is 
um, the binary decision process that determine who is counted as poor or multidimensional poor. And if we think about this in a kind of a matrix setup where you have the units in the rows, individuals or households, and in the columns, we have these different dimensions. So this is basically the process of deciding which of these units in a row wise sense is going to be identified as multidimensionally poor. Then you have, in addition to that, the intensity of that poverty, and that's the degree of poverty experienced by a given unit, and that will range between zero and one. And finally, we have the issue of aggregation, which is the step by which we transform all these observations, which is now just a, a, a vector, into a single overall metric. That's typically just a sample weight or just an average. Uh, and again, we're gonna ignore that issue here because that's relatively straightforward. So what we're really interested primarily here is this process of identification. Uh, and slightly relatedly, but that comes later, is how do we adjust this then for like, intensity? Um, okay, so we're gonna start with the Alkia Foster identification procedure. Uh, this is by far the most uh, you know, dominant and you know, very powerful approach that, that, uh, that we've seen used globally. And as Sabina mentioned, is also being used in in Mozambique, I've been heavily involved in some of the uh, national poverty assessments. Uh, as of the last national poverty assessment, we used uh, the uh, IKEA Foster approach within that as part of the multidimensional analysis. So here we have, as usual, the, the standard input is, uh, or standard setup is uh, what we call D, a matrix of binary deprivation indicators, as I mentioned before, uh, with elements D, I, J. So I is the unit and J is the is the dimension. And in addition to that, we have the normalized vector of weights. So one weight per dimension and a cutoff. And I'm sure most of us are very familiar that how does this identify a unit as poor is simply we take the weighted sum of these uh, deprivations for any given row. And if that weighted sum is uh, at least equal to the cutoff, then we determine that HI is equal to one. So that's you know, really very simple, very powerful approach and straightforward. So it's basically a you know, weighted sum. If that sum is greater than the threshold, then that unit is identified as multidimensionally poor. Uh, if not, it's a zero. Okay, so what are the challenges associated with that? Well, <clears throat> um, one of the issues that has that piqued my interest that I already mentioned is that it turns out that different choices for the weight vector W and the cutoff K can actually map to identical poverty identification role results for a given input matrix. So for the given data we have, different weights and cutoffs can often map to exactly the same result. Now, I think most of many people working in this area have kind of known this perhaps intuitively, but I think it's just worth um, just re-emphasizing what this is. And here's just some, some examples. These aren't statistical flukes. These are you know, examples and I'll show how, why this is the case uh, uh, later on. So 1A, 1B, 1C uh, are all different choices of weight vectors and cutoffs, but they all map to exactly the same identification. So they always map exactly the same units as poor. So that's why the H in this case, which is the aggregate measure of poverty for, uh, I think this is actually done on the Mozambican data set, but it doesn't matter, always maps to exactly the same number. So 1A is just a, a set of equal weights and a cutoff of 0.8. Whereas as you can see, 1B and 1C uh, are rather different, I mean, not necessarily hugely different, but they are different weights. So with different rankings of the different dimensions, if we, uh, if we rank the weights in order, um, <clears throat> but they map to the same. Uh, two A, B and C do the same thing. So they, 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 uh, they're basically sets of weights and cutoffs, which map exactly to, in this case, a slightly different set of people as poor, but 2A, 2B and 2C, are essentially um, equivalent, or they're actually identical functions from uh, a purely technical point of view. So as you can see, what's perhaps more interesting about this is that we have quite large variations 
in the weights themselves or what seem to be large variations. For example, if we just take uh, weight one, in 2A it takes a, a weight of 0.328, whereas in 2C it's 0.136. So again, the rankings of the different dimensions here change quite dramatically, but effectively they identify, they always identify the same units as poor. Note, however, and we'll get back to this issue, that of course, when we use different weights, the adjusted poverty count does change depending on that weight vector. So that's actually um, an issue that we might want to consider and discuss whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. So what are the consequences of what I call non-uniqueness? Well, first of all, distinguishing different poverty definitions, if we call a poverty definition some combination of W and K, that might give at least a false sense of precision and specificity that actually they're not so different after all. Moreover, um, it raises the question of, of whether we can or should use the weights to indicate the relative importance of the different dimensions. As I showed before, the ranks are not stable necessarily, but they can all off, they you know, might map to the same poverty identification profile. And we also have the, the challenge uh, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is, is open to discussion, but we have finite end identification outcomes, but infinite choices of the weights. And that means that confusingly, the, the adjusted poverty count could be quite sensitive to the choice of weights, while the poverty uh, head count, the H, is, is less so. So that raises a set of challenges and, and issues uh, to, you know, for us to reflect on. Another uh, potential, and I say this is very much a potential limitation, in many cases it's not a limitation at all, but it could be, uh, is the, the, the approach assumes perfect substitutability between all subsets of intersecting deprivations of a given size. <clears throat> now, to understand this, it's, uh, we can just do this essential, this kind of thought experiment. We can take any, uh, for a given, choice of the weight vector in K. Let's order the weights from smallest to largest. So W bracket one is the smallest of the weights, W bracket two is the next smallest and so on and so forth. Now for, for this ordering, it's very easy to find the smallest integer P such that the sum of these, this ordered uh, set of weights is greater than or equal to K. So for instance, if P is three, that means we only need the three smallest weights to exceed the threshold. In which case it follows that all units deprived in at least three or P dimensions, in that case three, will be identified as four. And then in turn, it means that any P tuple, any group of uh, deprivations um, of size P, will be a substitute for any other in the production of deprivation. So, so in that case that I gave the where at least uh, three uh, is needed, that means if you get any group of three deprivations, that will always exceed the threshold because the three smallest weighted ones do so. Now, of course, that's not necessarily an issue or problem, but what it does mean is that we cannot generally encode certain kinds of functions where we might want the degree of substitutability to vary between distinct subgroups of deprivation indicators. And this comes actually from a well-known issue in, in weighted voting games and, and other applications of similar functions. It's the difficulty of, of encoding nonlinear functions. And one of these is a one from each dimension. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, as I, uh, oh, sorry, in this case, it should be one from each do domain, apologies. So if we, if we group these de deprivation indicators, I'm just giving you an example here, into two domains, A and B, you know, we might want hypothetically to define a, uh, as multidimensionally poor, anyone who is poor in at least one dimension from each domain. So at least one from A and at least one from B. Now it turns out you can't actually do that using a, uh, in this specific case, with these specific weights, note the specific weights here for domain A and domain B are half-half. It turns out you can't do that with a, uh, a threshold switching function, which is the same as what, what, what the Alkia-Foster approach is. 
So let's just give an example. Okay, let's take K, the threshold is 5 twelfths, which is 1 fourth plus 1 6. Yes, in many cases that will identify units as poor that, uh, uh, that have uh, one of each domain, one of, either a, one of A and one of B. But it will also classify individuals as poor, those who are only deprived in all of A or all of B. Equally, we might want to go to the next plausible threshold, which is K as a half, but this requires at least three dimensions. So again, it won't identify individual units as poor who are only deprived in two dimensions, one from A, one from B. So D1 and D3, or D2 and D4, for instance. So the point is, is that it, it's somewhat restrictive in terms of the kinds of um, uh, identification functions that can be encoded. So as I said before, this is not necessarily a, a, a problem, but the one from each domain kind of approach is intuitively appealing in some circumstances. So what can be done? So here we move to this issue of minimal bundles. And so actually it turns out the previous results reflect um, the fact that the, the Alkir Foster procedure relies on what's known uh, in the wider literature as a threshold switching function, which is just a restricted linear type of positive switching function. So it's a Boolean function, it's positive, and it's a, it's a particular kind of one that basically applies a threshold. But it turns out that actually more general positive switching functions can be used. So there's no real reason why we might necessarily want to only use the Archaea Foster approach. Uh, or <clears throat> we might want, under certain circumstances, to broaden the kinds of poverty or of, uh, of identification functions that can be used. And just for clarification, when I say a switching function, what I mean is that's just a mapping of some vector, uh, some zero one vector in M dimensions uh, to a zero one output, which is also, and it links actually to a, a much, uh, well, a, a huge literature on voting games. The positive switching functions are just mon monotonically increasing. And it turns out from the literature on these kinds of functions and the mathematical literature is that these functions are actually uniquely defined by their set of true points. So the set of true points is the unique combinations of inputs, in our case, the deprivation dimensions, that yield a positive outcome. And we can uh, identify that as, the, as this, the, the sets of true points, so this, as this set T here, big T, uh, which is given by the function F. And that's a subset of the, you know, the entire possibility uh, that we'll see in the next, um, the next uh, slide. So actually we can use as a very, very general approach, uh, a truth table. So this is what a truth table in this case looks like. Now this is just for five uh, dimensions. And obviously the truth tables become, and we'll, we can discuss this, become very, very large when you have a lot more dimensions. But in five, you just have two to the power of five, which is 32 unique combinations of five zero one inputs. So there, for this large column here called bundles, this actually indexes on ID, indexes all the possible input vectors uh, <coughs> that, that could be possible, that, that, that are feasible. So if, if we were looking at that data in a matrix of, of individuals, we could just collapse the data into all, all unique combinations of these uh, deprivations. And actually the, uh, the column here, pi, what that gives is just an example of, of what that would look like if we just showed well, what percentage of, of observations have this set of deprivations. So in our case there, for ID1, we have 9% or 0.089 have, are deprived on no dimensions. And at, at the end there on 32, index 32 or row 32, we have 15% which are deprived in all dimensions. Now, as I said before, when I talked about the different weight vectors are being equivalent, it's be precisely because they have the same sets 
of true points. So 1A, 1B, 1C is what I referred to earlier. And these are the sets of true points for each of those poverty identification functions. So <clears throat> what I mean by a set of true points is that, for example, in 1A, if we look at row 16, what we see there is that we have a, a, um, a set of inputs, which is poor in D1, D2, D3, D4, but not poor in D5. But and that set of inputs, sorry, identifies a unit as poor in all those three uh, poverty definitions. So it is this set of true points which distinguishes between the different functions. And if we see uh, identification functions, the different ones to A, to B, to C that I mentioned before, as you can see again, their set of true points in this, these bundles uh, are equivalent. So this is, I think, you know, our first starting point for us to realize you know, what's really what's going on in, in the mechanics in kind of behind the scenes in terms of these identification approaches. So it's actually quite straightforward here then to see that an output vector associated with a given switching function f in the truth table is also sufficient for poverty identification. So once we have, what I'm trying to say is once we have the index, the true points, it's very easy to do, I mean, that is the poverty identification, and from that, it's very easy to construct uh, an aggregate headcount. All we need to do is take the sum of the proportion of observations with that unique combination of inputs, add them up, and you have the poverty headcount for that given true point index. And that's exactly what I'm showing here, but just, uh, I guess, in more technical terms. So all we need to do is take the sum of the proportions for those true points. So this is extended identification in practice. So what, it, what that means, which is potentially quite simple, is we want to choose a set of M deprivation indicators, as I discussed before, but perhaps grouped into broader domains. We collapse the observed data into the collection of at most t, two to the power of M unique deprivation bundles. That's to construct the truth table. We then select an identification rule, which can be any positive Boolean function or monotonic gain. So we can certainly continue to use the Alkia threshold, uh, Alkia um, foster identification function, which is a threshold switching function, but we are not restricted to that. We identify all, all true points of function F, uh, which describe which uh, of all feasible bundles, which of those defining units is poor. And then we calculate the multidimensional poverty headcount by summing up the proportions of observations in each of those uh, unique bundles. So in many ways, this is just a way to extend multidimensional poverty identification to more a more broad or the general class of positive um, <coughs> switching functions. Of course, there are some caveats that um, many people will start to notice and were probably already at the tip of their tongue. How do we represent these? How do we write down these different kinds of switching functions, even if we wanted to. And it is indeed very true that a huge advantage of the Alkia Foster approach is that the threshold switching functions are very easy and compact to write down. We only need a set of weights and a, and a cutoff. It's not necessarily so obvious if you want to do a broader class or, or have a nonlinear one. So the question is, what about these non-threshold switching functions? Well, it's not necessarily, not necessarily uh, it can be, but it's not necessarily much more complicated. In fact, there's a result in the literature that says that any positive Boolean function, any which also is a monotonic voting game, can be expressed as the intersection of, of, of a number of different threshold functions. So actually, one can just apply kind of sub threshold functions, so sub Alkia Foster type threshold functions within a group, within a domain of interest and then have one at the top. So it's a nesting type approach, and that is actually sufficient to identify any positive Boolean function. Uh, the other alternative, which is quite general as well, is to focus not on all the different bundles, but, but just the minimal bundles. What do I mean there? Well, from mon monotonicity, we only need the set of bundles that is minimally sufficient to classify a unit as poor. And by that, I mean all the bundles 
all those bundles in which all dimensions are swing. So again, this is a slightly using some terminology from weighted voting games, but a swing dimension in this case is that if that dimension were to switch from one to zero, then no longer would that identify the unit as, in this case, multidimensional four. So if all the dimensions are swing, that means if any one of them switches to zero, turns off, then that unit would no longer be classified as poor. So basically, uh, and it turns out, again, a result from the Boolean mathematical literature is that any underlying Boolean function is just the union, so the ors, of these minimal deprivation bundles. So going back to the, uh, the question before about how could we uh, do a one from each domain type um, identification, well, it turns out that that's all is needed in this case. And obviously, it's very easy to write down uh, in, you know, in any programming language. All we need to do is kind of write out this uh, simple function here. We just take the, we take the, <coughs> the inputs d1 and d2, add them together, and multiply them by the inputs d3, d4, and d5. Uh, and if that you know, sum, or if that, sorry, if that uh, product is greater than one, then we turn that unit onto, uh, uh, identify the unit as poor, zero otherwise. And if I just go back a, a few slides, and we look at the last column here, well, that last column is essentially that those true points for exactly that definition. So as you can see, you know, in many cases, it's going to be similar to some poverty uh, definition, but not always. Okay, so this is how we can represent uh, different switching functions. So it turns out, you know, it's not necessarily more complicated. It probably just needs a little bit of additional coding, but not more than a couple of lines, typically, uh, to, to do that. The other question is intensity. So as we all know that, you know, that while the poverty headcount is informative, often we're interested in the adjusted headcount, which adjusts for the intensity of poverty uh, of deprivation. The problem is, is of course, if we take uh, the approach that I suggested previously, focusing on the bundles, how can one calculate this? We don't have explicit weights. Well, it turns out, again, that game theory does provide an answer. So actually game theory has, has invested a lot of time and attention into voting games, which are actually, you know, basically uh, very similar to what we're dealing with here. And there the notion of power in game theory, which is the power of each dimension is indicating which dimensions are relatively more decisive in switching the function from zero to one. So what we can have here, we can apply that logic is we have our function our switching function f that gives us a set of true points. And it is really those true points uh, that indicate uh, implicitly the power of the different uh, dimensions. And actually we have a number of the two main ones in the literature, although there are a number, the two main ones are the Banzhaf power index and the, uh, the Shapley value. So the Banzhaf power index, which uh, I talk about it in the paper, and I don't actually go into the Shapley one in, in this paper, but it's, it's feasible to do it, and I've done it separately, is it takes the measure, the measure of power, it takes the relative frequency of each dimension in the collection of minimal bundles. So if we take a collection of minimal bundles, uh, those dimensions, which are always, as I mentioned before, swing or critical, which uh, make the difference at the margin between being poor and non-poor, then that gets a relatively higher weight. So it's important to mention here that if we go back to that truth table, you know, what is unique is that if you take the truth table, it's the index of the true points associated with the bundles that gives the, the weights, the, the, the power, sorry, it gives the power measure. So regardless of which, weights you might have used, even if you apply the Alcaeus Foster approach, you can apply whatever weights you want, uh, <clears throat> that will still give you, you know, a different, uh, a specific and unique set of uh, power value, depending on which of those true points of that, uh, of that, uh, of that function. So this is just, just to give you an, an example here again, but going back to those different uh, functions that we've looked at before. So F1, which as you can remember was, uh, was a, a vector of equal weights, but it wasn't necessarily a vector of equal weights. It could be any 
uh, any of those three which were equivalent, the bands of power index here, Bz, gives actually the same, exactly the same power because all of them come in to the minimal bundles in the same frequency. They all have the same relative frequency in the set of minimal bundles. Uh, we can forget MBZ, that's just a slightly adjusted measure. If we take F2, again, remember there was one of these was uh, the one shown there, but there's many others which provide the same set of true points. The bands of power will be the same for all those that have the same set of true points. And as you can see here, the bands of power index is actually quite neat in this case and differentiates between, between 0.1 and 0.3. And finally, for that last uh, uh, function, which was the one from each domain, uh, while there were no set, there was no set of weights in the Alcair Foster sense that could produce those. What we do have is the set of the bands of power index for that function, which indicates, interestingly enough, it gives uh, pretty much the, the weights actually of, of the one quarter, one quarter, one sixth, one sixth. Uh, one sixth. So it's quite interesting that actually it reflects, you know, essentially their relative importance in, in some way. But we have here uh, an explicit, uh, sorry, uh, the, the implicit weights based on the function itself, based on the set of bundles that that function defines. And as you know, once we have that weight vector or the relative importance or, or, or whatever you want to call it, then various decompositions uh, follow naturally, and it's quite easy to, to implement them. <clears throat> so let me briefly, uh, I've got two more slides, just summarize uh, the contribution of this paper and then reflect a little bit on, on some potential directions which I am uh, uh, exploring and I would you know, love your, your feedback on. So as, I've, as I said, and I want to you know, uh, emphasize, uh, the paper, this paper does build on a, you know, a very long tradition of scholarship uh, and most of the ideas are not new, but they're you know, somewhat scattered, I would say. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the Archie Foster approach is extremely you know, powerful and effective, but it does have some limitations that may be relevant in some situations. And I highlighted two of those. First of all, the weights and the cut of choices are not uh, unique. So for any, identification uh, function, we can probably or well, virtually always find another set of weights or cutoffs, which would give you the exact same identification uh, of the units. And only certain poverty de de definitions can be encoded. This is not necessarily a restriction, but can be restrictive in some instances. So the main contribution then was to show how to extend poverty identification to other switching functions which is represented by the set of minimal bundles uh, and which nests the Alkia Foster approach as a special case. And in addition, uh, suggest the use of game theoretic weights. So they're derived uniquely from the set of minimal bundles. And again, this could be even used uh, within the existing Alkia Foster approach to say, well, this is the set of weights which are uniquely derived from the, uh, the bundles uh, identified by that approach uh, as uh, identifying an, ind an individual unit as four. And uh, if you're interested, I, I've written a bunch of functions in R that implement this analysis. So it is relatively you know, straightforward and, and, and easy to automate, to be honest. So finally, future directions. So as I said, I'd welcome any ideas, but uh, I think there's uh, at least four possible pathways. Um, first of all, I think it would be, and I'm certainly not a theoretician, here, but it might be useful to clarify among the candidate gain theoretic weight concepts, which might be the most appropriate uh, to apply here. So, you know, is it that the bands of power is uh, one is uh, relevant? Is it the Shapley value? Uh, I'm not sure from a theoretical point of view, which would be uh, the most appropriate. Um, <clears throat> secondly, I think it would be, you know, at least interesting um, to place the global MPI within the framework. So not only applying the game theoretic weight, so what are the game theoretic weights that the MPI implies and does that make a difference? Uh, but also perhaps, you know, uh, minimally as a robustness is to use a one from each dimension or domain definition. And if you uh, look in the paper, there's at least suggested evidence from the paper that actually it, there can be some material differences when we shift to these game theoretic weights 
particularly for poverty decompositions and that you know they can be quite sensitive to to the choice of weights and as i said before the advantage of the game theoretic weights is that they derive from the bundles themselves which you know the minimal group of that or the the true points are unique to each function there could be some work which would be quite interesting is to think about well can we think about subjective poverty de definitions and there's a large literature on how we can you know, get subjective poverty definitions or input, user input into poverty definitions, but to do that rather than from choosing ways to choose bundles. So could one think of some way that, that we could confront an individual, uh, you know, rural Mozambique and say, well, look, imagine you have two households. One household has this choice of bundle. One household has this bundle. Which of these would you determine as poor? And iteratively, one could actually start constructing a minimal set of bundles in that way. And finally, I think there's a route coming back full circle to robustness analysis. So actually, rather than varying the weights, shouldn't we be really varying these minimal bundles? So which are the bundles uh, that um, identify unit as poor? So um, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I believe, um, well, I guess I hand over now to James. So thank you. Why, thank you. All right, let me screen save then the share, I mean. All right. <laughs> so thanks so much. Uh, first of all, let me um, <clears throat> express my appreciation. Uh, that was a fabulous and clear presentation of the paper. In fact, it was far clearer and more, um, I thought more apparent than the paper itself. I really think that that's the one that you should send around to folks. Um, let me go back to, uh, so thanks so much. Uh, really happy to be here commenting on the paper. Um, I'll go back to al Qaeda Foster and do a little bit of review on that just to set the stage, talk about the paper, and then um, give my you know interpretation of different things. First, starting with what we begin with, the matrix of achievements, that's really where we start and where we started. Um, you know, the paper here starts with the reduced form saying, okay, we have a deprivation matrix, but there's lots of things you have to think about before you even think about a deprivation matrix, like what cutoff or what groups of, um, you know, what, if, if it's just kind of descriptions, which descriptions of a particular indicator, um, you know, the floor being something or the, roof being made out of something. Which one of these uh, are actually considered to be deprived? That's really an important part of this. So I wanted to start off by re re you know, returning to that, but bearing in mind that I think we can dispense with that for most of the discussion, uh, except for the brief discussion of the AF method. Dual cutoff, excuse me, dual cutoff approach has in fact the deprivation cutoffs included. These are part of the normative inputs which create the AF paper, the AF approach. So deprivation values, which are otherwise known as weights, also are there. Poverty cutoff, how, how much is enough? When is it too much so that you consider the deprivations are too much in the aggregate. So we consider a person to be poor. So the key advantages of AF is the ordinality. It really applies to very basic data. And it, in this point, wasn't really mentioned much. It was mentioned somewhat, but I have to really be incredibly, uh, emphasize an incredible amount on this. It's very easy to understand and implement. And in fact, we've seen it again and again be understood easily and implemented across the, the globe. So that advantage of linear stuff, which is well known by looking at the HDI, which, you know, versus the curvy HDI, you, you know, the linear aspect of this is really something that shouldn't be, shouldn't be ignored. All right, and the policy friendliness that entails from that. Finally, the second part 
of any poverty technology or methodology is not just identification, but aggregation. And the aggregation approach of the AF uh, approach to looking at poverty, it uses the same normative choices. It has some advantages that as a result, we get subgroup decomposability, break down by population subgroups. We can break down by different indicators and it satisfies this dimensional monotonicity, which is called positivity um, in the current paper. But that really is, is very, very much important. So um, general and specific identification functions. The AF defined as well as its specific identification function, a general mapping from a person's achievement to zero one indicator function, if you will, where the value I, value one means poor, value zero means uh, not poor. Then assumed ordinality, which allowed us to kind of compress it all into the deprivation matrix, and hence a person's deprivation profile or a row in that matrix. And notice that it becomes very simple that the inverse of this function, this identification function over the va value one gives you all those deprivation profiles that are gonna be poor and inverse at zero, all those that are gonna be non-poor. This relates of course to the terminology used here of true points and so on. The dual cutoff function is then constructed using normative weights, W and poverty cut off K. So here's a picture, putting it into two deprivations, where you have four potential deprivation profiles, just a very simple idea of what the restrictions are using the Alkire Foster linear approach. All right, so what do we have here? We have deprivation for person one on this axis, the horizontal axis, deprivations on the vertical axis for person two, and you either have zero non-deprived or, uh, did I say person? Holy cow. We have the first dimension of an individual is on the horizontal axis. And the second dimension or indicator is on the vertical axis. The person could be not deprived in either, could be deprived in both, deprived in the first one, not in the second, deprived in the second, not in the first. Those are the four vertices. I hope this is understandable. So now, rho, the identification, that's where we call it as rho, assigns to every one of those vertices, those points in space, discrete points, either zero or one with naturally zero going to zero, zero, I mean, if no one's deprived at all, then if a person is not deprived at all, then you're not considered to be uh, poor. On the other hand, if you're deprived in both available dimensions, you're considered, it would be natural to consider you to be poor. So these kind of nail down the two diagonal uh, points. The other two, of course, um, well, they would, uh, the other two can be entirely free. So you could have zero, one, zero, one. So how many, four possibilities? Clearly the four possibilities correspond to union, intersection, a statement that deprivation one is enough, no matter what happens to two, or a statement that two is enough, no matter what happens to one. Those are the four possibilities. Okay, so let's look at the dual cutoff case, linear cutoff between poor and non-poor. It's right, it's just a linear function that the weight times your deprivation or not in that dimension, plus the weight times whether or not you're deprived. The second dimension, um, add those two together, I mean, and you'll get a certain sum total, your score. And if that score exceeds the cutoff K, 
or is equal to it, you're considered to be poor. So the diagonal line here is that cutoff to the left, non-poor, to the right, poor. In this case, where I have W is equal to equal weights of 50-50 and K equal to 0.25, then clearly all of the three upper points are in the poor category. So you get union identification. Any deprivation is enough. Shift it outwards to have K equals 0.75 and you get, of course, intersection identification. Both are needed to be deprived in order to be considered to be poor. And then here's one. This sort of has the cases where a person is deprived in one, both being in the poor region and both where poor, the person is not deprived in one in the non-poor region. So the first deprivation is necessary and sufficient. Likewise, you can easily see how through different weights, shifting the 0.75 and 0.25 around, you would get the opposite and final case. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so let's observe from this. First of all, the direction of analysis is from normative data to identification function, not the other way around. This is not revealed preference or the integrability problem in microeconomics, which infers value from choice. This is not Kojic Basu's thesis where he tries to look at the revealed preference of governments. This is starting with values and obtaining what the implications would be in terms of identification and indeed aggregation. Yes, many different values yield the same identification function. That's because we have discrete points with continuous values for W and K, and it makes it inevitable. In fact, it might be viewed favorably as we saw just a second ago, you're robust to values. You can change values this way, that way, it doesn't change the numbers much or at all. So many different values. Suppose that I had slightly different weights to you and someone else had slightly different weights to both of us. It may be the case that even though our underlying values differ, our weights differ, we agree who is poor. And that could be a very good thing. In the simple case, all identifications are dual cutoff. So it turns out that in our simple case of two indicators, we get them all. There's nothing left. But in general, it's easy to see that linearity constraints. By making curved type of functions, you could do a heck of a lot more general. In fact, that's what you would get, the general case. Finally, note that. Um, uh, the same uh, normative data are also used in the aggregation, impacting the adjusted headcount ratio M0. It's the same data. The normative data matter. And in fact, M0 changes with weights. And that should be the case. So in the paper, the objectives are given to critically revisit AF dual cutoff identification and propose, propose alternative identifications that don't use weights and then show how it works. Specific results, non-uniqueness, two different WK pairs may produce identical identification function. There are functional restrictions. Yes, there are other identification functions that are not dual cutoff, indeed. Deprivation bundles. The identification function can be viewed through the logic through Bo Boolean logic or through game theory, which is equivalent. Indeed, representation, this is cool. You can use minimum deprivation bundles that confer poverty status to kind of build back up. The link to bonds off is also interesting there. Intensity, you can use bonds off to reconfigure to get weights again, even if you start with something that has nothing to do with the weights. This can then be used for the adjusted headcount ratio. And then there's this great example applied to data from Mozambique. All right, what I like, the presentation, great. Indeed, I think it is useful to do a deep dive into identification. Uh, it's good to focus, I mean, I think it's useful to focus on the reduced form of identification. Um, it's, it has some 
cool advantages. I think that the minimal bundle approach seems interesting, you know, that you have to have one from each different uh, grouping of indicators as a way of representing or understanding um, any row, any identification function. I hadn't thought of that. There are other intuitive rows that are nice to think of. I, 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 I really enjoyed the discussion in that respect. It was quite an interesting link to the mathematical constructs, switching functions, voting games, which Sabine and I had used in a recent paper. Uh, my GW co colleague in the law school, Bonzoff, uh, it's always good to see his uh, work being applied. Um, and I appreciate the example. It really helps understand how to use the alternative approach, particularly that Boolean table with the frequencies to, you know, it's a decomposition of the whole population. And I've used that in a number of measures. Um, in American Development Bank has a better jobs index and we've you know, constructed it that way. Okay, here's some remaining observations and questions. First, non-uniqueness. Why is this unexpected? It isn't. So you saw the graph, lots of lines would work. I get it. How much really is lost? Isn't the following interpretation a bit extreme, if not misguided? The non-uniqueness raises substantial challenge for the literature that treats differences in numerical values of the input parameters as reliable and direct indications of differences in who is identified as poor, as well as the relative importance of each indicator. When you have a normative approach to begin with, it, there's nothing there that is seen as a critique. It works fine in the right direction, and it was not meant to work in the wrong direction. So we weren't meant to have the integrability or revealed preference. So why is, um, in addition to this, there was a statement concerning the contrasting sensitivity of M0. Why is this unexpected or problematic? And here's the relevant quote. While a given combination of weights and cutoffs may not be unique from the point of view of poverty identification, the adjusted poverty headcount nonetheless remains sensitive. At least from a theoretical viewpoint, this does not seem to be entirely satisfying. I don't know what theoretical viewpoint you might be coming from to arrive at that statement. I just don't get it. I didn't understand the paper. So if you can explain, that'd be great. Um, functional restrictions. Uh, second limitation, yeah, is that they only admit specific, specific types of identification functions. Absolutely. Then it says, is not sufficiently flexible to precisely encode more complex poverty definitions, such as one from each dimension. And, and I would agree with that, but it gets us to the point, more complex poverty definitions. There is a trade-off between complexity and the ability to apply it. And so it, maybe through use that might actually be solved. But a priori, there is a question when you have a whole bunch of bundles and you're sitting before the minister and trying to explain it. Why is this unexpected? It really shouldn't be unexpected, linear versus curved in the graph. In fact, you could have curve and still have the same, same uh, 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 identification function. Or you could have curved and have a different beyond the Alkire Foster class. Why is this important? How restrictive is it really? I found the discussion of substitution and complements in the paper really unclear. In particular, what about Mexico, right? Which has, let's say 51% on income and 49% on the remaining six, okay? Now, what's your P? There's one, one variable, one indicator that'll do the trick to throw you into poverty. So not every one variable is gonna do that, just that one. So I didn't see that generalizing. I saw what you were doing and how you ordered things, and but it, you just sort of at the other end, you didn't really have a lot of clarity as to what, what things were happening. Is additional complexity desirable per se? I already said that. Linear is e easy to interpret. I already said that. And we meant it as an approximation in the absence of clear guidance on functional form and com you know complements or substitutes. We, we just didn't know. We threw up our hands. One per grouping is a nice example, right? But how important is it 
And that is where the action comes in. Which ones are missing, missing how important they are? And how far from AF are they really? As you said, you can construct in one direction the identification from a bunch of AFs. Likewise, my student, uh, uh, Sun Khan, Khan Sun, actually, sorry about that, uh, had uh, come to me and said, you know, if you just change the variables so that the variables were like intersection, this or this or this, then it's a pure AF approach. I said, yeah, you're right. That would be true. We could do that within the dimensions. Maybe other changes in identification also might be more important. Say you have cardinal variables, maybe it would be more important to incorporate information on the cardinal variables into the identification. Maybe that direction is uh, also an important one. I, I guess I could ask my student since he's working on his thesis on that. Deprivation bundles and representation. Uh, representation. Uh, I, I was sometimes challenged by the literatures and terminologies that you invoked. Unclear definitions throughout. I didn't get what positive threshold switching function meant until far later. Um, and then true points, I didn't know what space we were in even when you were talking about true points. Your presentation was quite clear though. Um, links with multidimensional literature were left a bit unclear. Sometimes the you know, you had two definitions, use the one from another literature. And if you use the one or at least equated it up front, we'd be able to understand a little bit better as we moved along. This may actually have a little impact on take up of the very useful bits in the paper. Um, everything, you know, it seems nifty in theory, but why would policymakers adopt it? That's gonna be the big question. Intensity, I agree that using H alone is insufficient. Indeed, too much focus on H in the first part of the paper, it was almost all H discussion. Uh, but let me get this straight. You drop the normative W from consideration because it's not general enough. Now you're creating a new vector of weight from your identification function alone. No normative input, nothing. You know, using a rather complicated value from cooperative game theory, which is clearly not unique. Why not use Shapley or other values? So there's a ton of values out there that you could use. So you've already addressed this in your own you know, future work, so I, I won't go into it, but what would the resulting M0 that you get from bonds off values really mean? And why should we look at it as important? The example, yeah, that was great. The approach can be applied, thank you. I really like the Boolean table with frequencies decomposing the population by deprivation profiles, that's helpful. Um, but number of bundles, minimal or otherwise, I don't know what the heck that means. So I'm just gonna say it disappears. And I wanna say thanks to everyone for listening to me. Thank you firstly to, to James for taking the time and effort to, to go through the paper and uh, respond so comprehensively. So I, I guess, uh, I mean, I agree actually with most of what you say. Uh, I mean, I, I, I fully agree that not, none of this is necessarily expected, uh, but you know, that's coming from you, James, who you know, really understands how this approach, the Alkia Foster approach works. I think there's many people out there, you know, casual users perhaps, who don't necessarily appreciate some of these you know, slightly finer points. So yeah. at least one of the you know, very minor contributions was uh, slightly in a, in a sense to try and kind of uh, raise uh, these these points. And I think you probably did it a pretty, you know, very well in your presentation. It could have been done a bit more simply, but it's also to, to, to highlight the fact that, you know, these weights are not necessarily unique, you get the same. So, uh, but I like the point and I, I, and I haven't appreciated it sufficiently that this is a, you know, it's not necessarily weakness, it's also a strength. That, 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 that you get, you know, that is robust to, you know, many different weights that you would choose. And I, I you know, I think that's an important, important way of thinking about it. So, and, and I also like, and I would need to, you know, reflect a little bit more on this point that you start from the normative and, uh, and that drives everything. And I think that's, that's interesting. I think my immediate reaction to that though, and again, maybe coming from a user's perspective is to think that, you know, as a user, you might think, well, you know, these weights normatively say 
that this dimension is the most important. But it turns out that it's not necessarily the case, right? And I think that's that's the issue is that, you know, if we think of as a user, these weights as kind of in some way um, reflecting the relative importance of the different dimensions, you know, it turns out that that's not always the case. So it could be, you know, if you think about, again, that, that truth table, that, you know, a different weight vector with a different ranking of weights is going to give you the same identification. So, so I think that's, I mean, whether that's good or bad, I don't know, right? But I think it's at least important to, to point out. Um, <clears throat> and actually, you know, the, 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 the issue there, which is why it's useful to go from the bundles to the game theoretic weight, is that that's unique, right? It's unique to that identification function. But I, I mean, I get the point that, you know, it does, it's not driven by what's normative. But again, I don't necessarily fully understand what you mean by normative content in that case. I mean, that's quite a, it's quite a vague concept. So in, in a sense that the, the approach there is saying, well, these are the bundles, it's very clear, that uniquely defines the, the identification, in your case, the row. You know, row is, is actually uniquely defined by a set of true points. And from that, we get the unique game theoretic weights. So in, in a sense, it's, it's, I guess, theoretically neater because it avoids the problem of, of, of having a certain set of weights, but actually a, a, the, you know, the same identification function. So I'm not sure if I'm, I'm being sufficiently clear, but, but I think it was that logic, but I hadn't thought of it from the point of view of, of what you know, this normative content is most important. And I guess you know, the, the other point, and you know, I, I fully agree, is that you know, is more complexity desirable? Probably not, no, uh, I agree. However, as you admitted, the one from each domain can be actually quite an intuitive approach. So even if one were to apply it to the global, you know, the global MPI, one could say, well, it would be quite interesting to see to what extent that might change things. But that's an empirical question, right? So as I said in the in the in the thoughts, it's like what uh, it'd be interesting to do a, a dive into the data a bit more to see, well, how much does this change? I mean, on the one hand, I think probably not a great deal, but it might change quite a bit for the poverty decompositions. Uh, because that's where, where things do seem to be a bit more sensitive. But anyway, I, I will leave it there because there could be questions, um, uh, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. I'll use my prerogative as chair to ask the first question, and then there are a couple more in the chat that we'll go to immediately after, for which many thanks. Um, first of all, again, thank you so much. Um, really, really interesting insights and um, uh, di discussing identification and thinking about it. And actually we do um, two things um, very regularly. One is when we are setting a K, um, then we actually think of the bundles and try to look at the intuition. And we basically look at a piece of paper and we talk. If you have this and this and this, you'll be poor. If you have this and this and this, you'll be poor. does it make sense? So that's part of the normative exercise that James was talking about that we've done with a lot of the MP MPIs. And I wasn't clear about the intuition of what you were proposing to replace that with. But the other thing we do with what you were calling the truth table, mm -hmm. we basically see um, different people and different vectors of deprivations. First of all, it's important to know what clusters together for policy reasons, because if the same deprivations cluster together, they should be treated together. And it's just much clearer to see it black and white you know, browse and get those um, different profiles and use that for policy or use that for budgeting with unit costs or use that. So I think that step has many more applications than maybe you've appreciated that are actually real, very real. Um, and I'd love to, love to engage more, for, further on that. But my question um, is a little bit um, in a different angle. Um, the criticisms that we get are often not, you'd have one per, per dimension. Um, the criticism is a person is severely undernourished and that's a huge deprivation. Why do they need anything else? Um, or, you know, so, so looking at severity where we've said actually then you could have undernutrition and severe undernutrition with weights within the nutrition 
And so if you're severely undernourished, we were able to capture that in a sense in the indicator profile. Um, but we haven't had a demand so far for the one per dimension, um, perhaps because it's going to leave out people. So I wondered if in your um, example, if you had basically looked at all the people you're leaving out because they only have deprivations in one dimension and just thinking about them and what's their life like and why aren't they poor and how will policymakers feel if we just censor them from the matrix? Because I think it would be interesting to know the proportion of poor people who you would drop because they don't qualify for this identification and who they are and just get a sense for their lives. So that that would be just, did you do that um, that kind of question? Thank you. Great, shall I, shall I respond? Yeah, just, just very quickly on that and uh, thank you. So I mean, in, in a sense, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to hear that actually in practice, the bundles are the focus because it sounds like, you know, I, I think we're all in agreement that that's really that the content of some of these measures is really which are the bundles that are, you know, identifying individuals as poor and which are, are the ones that, that don't. So that comes back to that point about actually that truth table is really at the heart of the mechanics of any measure, including the al Foster. So all, I guess, the, the you know, the, the minor, uh, well, the, the contribution there of the paper is to say, yes, definitely let's focus on the bundles. And secondly, if you wanted, you could actually use nonlinear um, approaches because it just, it just gives you a different set of bundles. So, you know, I think on the issue of severity, I hadn't, I hadn't considered it. But it sounds a little bit to me that, that what there is, is almost your, your kind of thinking of perhaps this nested approach that I spoke of, which again, actually, a, it, it can be shown as bundles, but you, you know, a nested al Foster, where you have a broad one across the different groups of indicators, but one for each underlying group uh, can be actually, you know, um, sufficient to encode anything you want. So that could be, you know, one way to explore, to go. And you know, on the on the who we are leaving out, yeah, I definitely in, in 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 applied situations, I think that's right. I mean, that's exactly what one needs to be doing is discussing. Well, what are these bundles doing? What is the implications of this definition versus this definition? And that's you know that's where you get through these what I call minimal bundles, which is the you know the core grouping of them. That 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 shows you what's in and, and what's out. I mean, in the, in the application to Mozambique, and I guess this was merely just a technical exercise to demonstrate that this, you know, that how, how this approach works, but I fully agree in practice, that's obviously, you know, absolutely fundamental. Thank you. Thank you. And then there are two questions and we'll definitely take those and probably call it quits after that. But if anybody has a burning question, please put it in. So the first from Ryan McQuay, and you can read it. Um, uh, it's um, about the inclusion of fuzziness. Yeah, I mean, uh... And, and, you know, I'll I be completely honest, I'm not 100%, you know, up to date on the fuzziness aspect. So, uh, you know, unless Ryan would have the time to, you know, explain that a little bit more, I'm just not, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I think probably perhaps the issue there is that, you know, this paper definitely excludes a lot of other issues. I mean, uh, James mentioned, you know, the dual cutoff and, and of course a huge amount of work and there's absolutely no doubt about it is about, well, how do we get this deprivation matrix D, right, that I spoke about? And, you know, sorry, but <laughs> I kind of assumed that and that is obviously a huge issue. And, you know, if, if where fuzziness comes in perhaps is about, well, is, is that about how we go from a continuous to a binary measure on a given indicator? I don't know. Yeah, so it's but anyway, instead of yeah. zero, one you'd have yeah. zero and some membership function of a, the probability that you were actually deprived. So that would be- Right, yeah, yeah. So non, okay, non, uh, okay, yeah. And that's, that 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 degree of extension, I, I would have to consider what, what the implications would be. I think it would be, make it rather more complex to, to apply, to be honest. But- uh, the other thing, perfect. Yeah, I'd say to Ryan is check your membership function that it's, is good for the kind of data we have because many membership functions require cardinal data. So the next one is by Kan Sun, whom James mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And um, he was looking at you know, the groups of the, the poor people and the composition of that group. So that question. Uh, let me just read it. Sorry, I didn't have a chance to read it, so. 
Yeah, it, well, exactly. It's exactly the same group of poor people. That's right, because of the truth table. So if you look at the truth table, the truth table is, you know, all unique combinations of those, of that input vector, the zeros and ones. So yes, it's, it's an exact mapping. Um, which is, but it's exactly true that the n naught changes because it's sensitive to the weights, right? So I think James James probably explained it better than I did. Um, <clears throat> so it's not that the composition of who's identified as poor changes. It's it's really just the intensity varies because it under some weight vectors you're just giving slightly different weights to 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 these underlying uh, underlying values. Um, so yeah, it it it's certainly. The point is, is that it's the identification function that vector of true point, true point stays the same, but the intensity can vary. So these are, you know, these are important. Important. It's important to to understand that mechanics uh, because that helps clarify, you know, really what's going on in terms of both the alkyl fo foster. So this is not to dispense with the alkyl foster. It's just perhaps shedding light on the mechanics of the alkyl foster. And showing that, oh, by the way, if you're interested in uh, in extending it to nonlinear, that's actually quite uh, doable. It can be, you know, relatively easily extended. And also to to show, well, if we're, you know, if we want um, a set of implicit weights which which identify the relative importance at the margin. Of different dimensions, so it's in kind of a, a more theoretically grounded sense of what these different relative importance is. You can use some concepts from game theory to do that. So I say that would be where the where the contribution lies. So it's consistent with Alkia Posta, but provides some potential ways to extend it. I hope that is clear. So much. So this has been a wonderful exchange. I wish we had longer. I wish we had time to talk about our tests for robustness to different vectors of weights. I wish we had, you know, time to to go into more details about um, what would be the properties of identification if the weights um, were based on other things. What would that do to the focus axioms? Would it be comparable over time? Would the same person be identified as poor? They have the same deprivation profiles in two periods of time. So there are lots of questions that come up when we have this kind of exchange, but it's been very stimulating and interesting. I'd like to thank Sam Jones and thank James Foster. I'd like to ask the panelists, please, to log on with the uh, for the Afterglow uh, with the link that you'll find in your emails. I'd like to thank all the participants and welcome you back to the seminar next week. Back to you, James. Well, that's it for today. See you next time here in the same old place next week. Bye-bye.